we, that is God, had made an end of speaking with him, that is Moses, on Mount Sinai, he gave him Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Now when the people saw that Moses today coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to hear him and said to him, Come, make us God, and we'll go before us. For after this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And he said to them, Bring all the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to the other And he received the gold from their hands, and he fashioned them into an engraving tool and made them all his car. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, and all the tribes of Andrew, yet true. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before him, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rolled the earth on the next day, offered their own offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rolled out of the plain. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Then they they have turned aside and put me out of the way in which I commanded them. They have made themselves a Moses calm and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them and, my, and may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? So you have brought out the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak and say, He brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides. On the one side and on the other they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But Moses said, It is not the voice of those who shout in victory, nor is it the voice of those who cry out in defeat, but the voice of those who sing that I hear. So it was, as soon as he came near the camp, and he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made, burned it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and he scattered it on the water, and made the children of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you, that you have brought so great a sin upon them? And Moses said, Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods that shall go before us. After this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them bring it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and this calf came out. Now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, let him come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp. And let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And about three thousand men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day. The Lord will add his blessing to his word. Good evening. We had an interesting meeting this afternoon, mainly for leaders and their wives. And uh, 
I talked about something which uh, is, is an objective fact. I make no god of education or theological education. I know people with theological educations that are on their way to hell. They're not even saved. You don't need a theological education in the academic sense to be a minister. But you do need to know the Word of God. If somebody is unable to rightly divide the Word of God, they have no business whatsoever being a minister. That's what the Word of God says in First Timothy. No business whatsoever. Now, I'm not against theological education, but I was a, a missionary in the Middle East for years without one. I studied science as a kid. Only when I was older did I go to Britain and become educated in academic theology. I did know Hebrew, of course, but that was just a plus, a natural plus I had. I learned Greek and things like that later. In any event, it is an objective fact that the standards of education and biblical knowledge among Pentecostal and charismatic ministers are very, 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 very low. Extremely low. You're not simply dealing with men who are by and large uneducated academically. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me is you're dealing with people who have never been taught the Word of God. The old-time Pentecostals were. They knew their Bibles and their doctrines much better. That's by and large gone now. This afternoon, we had a minister who took exception when he saw the videos you're going to see tomorrow. We showed the videos of Rodney Brown and Kenneth Copeland and crazy things from around the world, which we'll be showing here tomorrow. We certainly encourage you to join us and bring your friends. And he couldn't deny what he saw, and I pointed out that the Pentecostal leadership in this country, including the Pentecostal leadership of his denomination, which was apostolic, brought this in. And he became very angry and disturbed until Philip held up the brochure showing that the general superintendent of the apostolic denomination endorsed Rodney Brown and was one of the people who brought him into this country. I mean, again, if you can't refute the message, you shoot the messenger. <laughs> Just like the Sanhedrin. I couldn't deal with what Jesus said. And then he was angry because I, I looked at Acts 3.19. And I said, let's look at Acts 3.19 which is what they're all saying. You see, they have a problem. The problem with the proponents of the Toronto phenomena, their first problem is they don't know what it is or how to define it biblically. They must admit that it's been around in America for going on three years, and Britain for two years, Australia for two years, New Zealand for two years, and it hasn't brought a real revival in the sense of Wesley's revivals or anything else. So they can't say it's a revival, but they admit that. Originally they said it was a revival, as you'll see in the videos tomorrow. Now they're saying it's not a revival, it's a time of refreshing. They've had to try to redefine it. And you'll see people on the videos tomorrow saying, if God can do this for me, if he can give it to me. Well, I ask, what is it? First of all, you know, what is it? This one man up there in, in the airport vineyard church in Toronto was saying, if God can set me free, well, set free of what? You can use the term set free when somebody's born again, was set free from the power of sin and death. But the man already was born again, so he couldn't be talking about that. Then most of the people who are involved in all of the people are already charismatic and Pentecostal. They're already people who claim to be baptized in the Spirit or have had a spirit baptism. So they obviously can't be talking about spirit baptism. Thirdly, it's not a revival, so I must ask, what is it? And the answer I usually get is Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, I'm a Pentecostal. I'm a charismatic. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I practice them. But the text does not say that a time of refreshing precedes repentance. It says that repentance precedes refreshing. No place does the Word of God say that a refreshing is the predecessor of revival. No place. Not even one place. It says the opposite. First comes the repentance, then God will refresh you. Again, it's bad enough that these people can't read Greek or Hebrew, but they can't even read English. More than that, in the verse, in the context, Peter is talking to unsaved people, not to Christians. The whole thing is absurd. Absolutely absurd. What is it? Well, anyway, he was angry that I said anybody who reads a verse like this is behaving like a moron. And I found out later they were grumbling because they couldn't refute what I said, that uh, 
Jesus said, call no man fool. I didn't say fool, I said moron. M-O-R-O-N. Fool is raka in Aramaic. As in the fool says in his heart there is no God. I didn't say these people were atheists. I said like what Paul said, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? And believe me, these people caught up in these things you'll see tomorrow on the video of being bewitched. They're being spiritually seduced, the Hebrew term, makshafut. In any event, let us look at the golden calf that Philip read from Exodus chapter 32. We have to understand the first thing about a golden calf is it is always an alien spirit pretending to be Yahweh. A golden calf is always an alien spirit, a foreign god, something demonic, pretending to be the true god. This is the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. They confused the golden calf with Yahweh. A better example is what happened with the priests of Baal. In the Baal worship of the ancient Near East, which was a Canaanite fertility cult, once again, a calf becomes a picture of their God, who they confuse with Yahweh. The priests of Baal did not begin worshipping this Canaanite Baal. Let me give you a brief lesson in the Hebrew language. The Hebrew word for husband is Baal. Yahweh was to be Israel's true Baal. The true Baal of heaven, Baal Shemaim, was Yahweh. But the, he, the priests of Baal, under the influences of Jezebel, who's a picture of the spirit of false religion in Revelation, begin worshipping the true God in an unbiblical way. You begin to worship the true God in an unbiblical way. That's how Baal worship began. They didn't begin worshipping a foreign Baal. They began worshipping the true one, Yahweh. But instead of worshipping him on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, where God ordained, they began worshipping him, rather, in what we call in Hebrew, Beimot, high places. And another spirit, an alien spirit, got in and began counterfeiting the true God. That's what happened. That's what always happened. Now again, Leviticus chapter 10 calls this burning strange fire. And I was astounded that, the, uh, that, a, that, a, that a member of the executive of the Assemblies of God in Australia, Philip, Philip Hills, actually says a little bit of strange fire is better than no fire. I wish he'd read the book of Leviticus. But God says that's dangerous and it will bring judgment. But this is what the Assemblies of God is teaching these days in Australia. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 says, Do not exceed the things which are written. Don't do that. Paul says it's written. However, about the month before last, John Wimber said, There is no biblical basis for what is happening at the airport vineyard church in Toronto. This is what John Wimber, the leader of the vineyard, says. We should just accept it anyway. And who are you going to believe? The Word of God or, or John Wimber, the leader of the vineyard? They're saying things that are contradictory. Once you exceed the things that are written, you fall into man-made doctrine. That's what Laodicea means, people's opinions. We just talked about that last night. You begin worshipping the true God in an unbiblical way, and an alien spirit gets in. The priests of Baal were unable to make the real fire fall. It didn't happen. Now, Elijah made it fall. He rebuilt something we call in Hebrew, Mesabeach, the ancient altar. Hebrews lets us know that an altar in the Old Testament is a type of the cross of Jesus. Jesus is our high priest, and when he dies on the cross, that is prefigured in the Old Testament by the high priest making atonement on the altar. Elijah was able to make the fire fall. How? He rebuilt the ancient altar. Any time the fire ever fell in the history of the church, it was because of the preaching of the cross. That was always the central message. The early Pentecostals, the fire really fell. Large numbers were saved. But what was their message? Was their message the Holy Spirit? No, it wasn't. Was the message signs and wonders? No, it wasn't. The message of early Pentecostalism was this power, power, wonder-working power, and the blood of the Lamb. They preached the cross. John Wesley, his whole message was holiness, repentance, the cross. The book of Acts, this Jesus whom you crucified. It has no resemblance to what you see today. In Wesley's revivals, in the book of Acts, and early Pentecostalism, huge numbers of people were being saved. That is not happening now. On the contrary, 
When unsaved people see 60 Minutes or the BBC and they see these excesses, it makes them want to not become Christians rather than causing them to want to become Christians. It prevents revival. It doesn't bring it. If the unsaved enter, will they not say you are mad? As we'll look at that tonight. Elijah made the fire fall by going back to the ancient altar. The only way real revival will come, that real Holy Ghost fire will fall and purify and bring revival to the church in this nation and restore it to any degree to its biblical heritage is the people go back to the cross. But these people don't want the cross. Just look at the videos tomorrow and see for yourself. They could be less interested in the cross. Their message is not the one of Wesley. It's not the one of early Pentecostalism. It's not the one of the Book of Acts. Instead, it's the priests of Baal. They had their cast, so they ranted and raved and tried to make the fire fall. They ranted and raved and behaved like lunatics. Woo! But the fire didn't fall. So they ranted and raved some more and behaved like lunatics even more excessively. Woo! And the fire didn't fall. And if you want to see lunatics, come and see the videos tomorrow that we watched this afternoon. Just like the priests of Baal, they can't make the fire fall, so they behave like lunatics. They had a calf cult. It was a calf. Golden calves spring up many times in Israel's history because they spring up many times in the history of the church. As we looked at this afternoon, the early Christians called Toronto-type phenomena Montanism. During the Reformation, the Munster Anabaptists did the same things in Germany, the same kind of nuttiness. The founders of the Quakers, George Fox's followers, the witness of the inner light and the quaking, it was the same thing. None of this is new. None of it. In vineyard churches in the United States, the same thing was going on 10, 12 years ago. Only then they said it was deliverance from demons. Now they're saying they made a mistake 10 years ago. It's the Holy Ghost. None of it's new. None of it. Absolutely none of it is without precedent. Many golden calves. Second Kings 10:29, a golden calf. Hosea 8, 5 and 6, a golden calf. Ho uh, Hosea 13, 2, a golden calf. The Montanists, a golden calf. The Munster Anabaptists, a golden calf. They always spring up at pivotal times in church history. None of this is without precedent. It's in the Old Testament and it's throughout history of the church as well as the history of Israel. But tonight we're going to look at two stories of golden calves, the two main ones, the one in Exodus, then we'll have a five-minute break, and we'll look at, Lord willing, the one in Kings. This calf worship, the bull cult, in Egypt were associated with the worship of Apis and Nevis. But in the land of Goshen, where the Jews were captive, it was associated with Horus worship. In Canaan, it became associated with Baal worship. We have to understand what exactly is happening here when Moses goes to get the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. This period of time, when Moses goes to get the Ten Commandments, is called in Judaism the Sphira, literally the counting. It is the period between the Jewish Feast of Pesach, Passover, and the Jewish Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, Hag Shavuot. The rabbis tell us that the Torah was given on the day of Pentecost. The same day the Holy Spirit was given is when the Torah was given to Moses when this happened. Now you have to understand that. This period is when the Jews have made so many of the biggest mistakes, such as following a false messiah who's a type of the Antichrist called Simon Bar Kokhba. They made a lot of mistakes at this time period. But this is the first. Moses tells the people at this time in the Jewish year, the same time of year, you wait, I'm going to get something. Jesus tells his disciples, you wait, I'm going to get something. Same time. The rabbis tell us in the Talmudic literature that when the Torah was given, they deduced it somehow from the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10 that a whirlwind was heard from heaven. And 30 tongues, Lashonot, were heard when the Torah was given. So the phenomena of tongues, glossolalia in Greek, 
is heard in the Old Testament when, tongue, when the Torah is given, according to the rabbis. And when the New Testament comes, and the Holy Spirit is given, the same phenomena recurs. Tongue. Only the difference being the following. When the Torah was given, 3,000 fell. When the Holy Spirit was given, 3,000 were saved. You understand? The right action of the apostles is seen as a reversal of the wrong action of Aaron and the children of Israel. You understand? The early Christians understood tongues partly this way. They saw it as a partial reversal of the curse of Babel, the Tower of Babel. God's judgment came separating nations on the basis of language. But through unity in Christ, that unity is partly restored. That's how they understood tongues in part in the early church. Now, the Torah is given and 3,000 fall. The Spirit is given, 3,000 are saved. Moses tells the children of Israel, wait! But they get rambunctious, and instead of waiting for the real thing, they make a golden calf, something which is an alien spirit counterfeiting the true God. The apostles, however, wait. God's definition of waiting, however, is very, very different than ours. Our definition of waiting works like this. Hanging around, waiting for a train, drinking coffee, when's the train coming? God's version of waiting is entirely different. His version of waiting always entails action. Always. Being faithful to what you already have. First of all, it's prayer. The apostles were given to prayer and fasting, waiting for the Spirit to fall. Our prayer and fasting will always be a factor in what happens in the heavenlies, as we see in the book of Daniel. We have a role to play in God's dynamic. Now, some people go overboard with this and get into all kinds of crazy teaching, like Peter Wagner, but that's nuts. There is a biblical truth, however. Now, secondly... God's idea of waiting always entails being faithful to what you already have and taking care of the business at hand the way the apostles were looking for a replacement for Judas at this period during the Sphira. Let's see what God's idea of waiting means. If you want the real thing to happen, wait. But what does wait mean? Remember what John Wesley said when he saw this kind of Toronto phenomena in his day. This is a satanic deception and a satanic counterfeit sent by the devil to disrupt what God is really wanting to do. That was Wesley's conclusion. Make no mistake about it. There are churches where God is working. The Holy Spirit is wanting to do something. If that was not the case, the devil would not raise up false teachers like Randy Clark and John Arnott and, 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 and these other people and Rodney Brown to do this at this time. He wouldn't make a golden calf at this time if God was not really wanting to do something authentic and genuine. But let's look. Wait. Look at Exodus chapter 19. Verse 7, So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. They're getting ready now for the Decalogue to be given, but Moses was already given commandments. All that God has spoken we will do. Until we are acting on the word of God, until we are already being faithful to what God has already given us in his word, he's not going to do anything else. Not until we act on what we already have will God do anything further. Our sojourning in this world is prefigured, according to 1 Corinthians 10, by the sojourning of the Jews in the wilderness. Moses is a type of Jesus, isn't he? Pharaoh is a type of the devil, the god of this world. In 1 Corinthians 10, just as Moses makes the covenant with blood and sprinkles it on the people, so does Jesus. As Moses leads the Hebrews out of Egypt, a figure of the world, through the water, through the wilderness, into the promised land, is the way Jesus leads us out of the world through baptism into heaven. But the sojourning in the wilderness is a picture of our sojourning in this world. 
They had the Shekinah, the Shekinah, Harawaka Kodesh, the Spirit of Holiness. And the Holy Spirit was moving in the cloud and in the fire. Sometimes it would move with works and signs of awesome power. Sometimes it would hover. Sometimes in the history of the church we see God moving dynamically, but sometimes he doesn't. But whether or not the Shekinah moved, the manna fell every day. The bread was always there. When did the people stop moving? When the Shekinah didn't. When did the Shekinah stop moving? When the people stopped being faithful to what they already had. One of the main characteristics of the charismatic movement after 30 years is that it has not been faithful to the Word of God. I honestly believe it began as an authentic move of God's Spirit. But at an early point, it sold out, it was betrayed by its leaders into the deception of ecumenism and compromise. After 30 years, look at the facts. There's no less crime, no less divorce, no less homosexuality, no less racism. Society is far worse off now than it was before the charismatic renewal. Why? Because the church is far worse off now than it was before the charismatic renewal. As I pointed out yesterday, I live in England. Thirty years ago, you wouldn't have found bishops denying the resurrection or the virgin birth. You wouldn't have found a once upon a time evangelical archbishop marching in a procession to Mary as you do now. The church is worse off after 30 years of renewal. How can the society be anything but worse off? The main reason the charismatic movement has failed so categorically, the first reason, Satan has torpedoed every charismatic renewal in the history of the church the same way. Experiential theology. People basing their doctrines on feelings and experience and subjective revelation to the negation of what's in God's word. And you see this today with people like Jill Austin, people trying to give us New Age philosophy in Christian masquerade. It's all New Age. It is not Christianity. Only the packaging. She set the stage for the deceptions of Toronto in this nation. She was sent by the vineyard ahead of time. Until we act on what we already have, God will do nothing further. His version of waiting requires action. Secondly, let's look further. Verse 10, And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people, consecrate them today, tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of the people. Let the people wash their garments. Repentance. Consecration. Unless there is a re-emphasis, on holiness and sanctification, God will not work. This church is the church of the Nazarene. Like any other church I know of, it has its strong points and its weak points. One of its strong points is it has a proper emphasis on holiness and sanctification. Until there is an emphasis on holiness and sanctification, God will not work. I do not see any of that evidence in any of the teaching associated with Toronto. In fact, I don't see any teaching associated with it, except for people taking verses out of context, which you'll see tomorrow. To understand this, we have to look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. He has not come to a mountain that may be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of trumpets and the sound of words which sound with such that those who heard begged that no further word should be spoken to them. When somebody has a real encounter with the holiness of God, it's an awesome, frightful thing. They didn't want to hear anymore. Look at being slain in the spirit in the Bible. Look when it really happens. Like when Jesus cast the demon out of the kid, and they think he's dead. Look at John chapter 1. John is in the spirit in the Lord's day, and he falls as if slain. One, he falls on his face. Daniel falls on his face. Any place the real thing happens, they always fall forward. The only time anybody fell backward is when they came to arrest Jesus, and God put his power on them to throw them back. In the Bible, they always fall forward. Secondly, they always tremble. They don't roll and laugh hysterically. And thirdly, they're different when they get up than when they go down. 
And what you see today is a lot of rubbish. It's just not biblical. A real encounter with God brings a sense of His holiness. Take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. People don't want to have a real encounter with God because they would realize their sin. Look at Peter, depart from him, a sinful man. The Apostle John knew Jesus. He was physically related to Jesus. When he saw Jesus in his manifest glory, he was terrified. The closer you get to the light, the more cognizant you are of the dirt. God is awesome and holy. People don't want holiness. They don't want to behold his real power till they make a golden calf that's going to let them laugh. What does Paul say? Wanting to have their ears tickled, they will turn aside from truth and accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own carnal desires. And these teachers will come in the character of Jonathan Jambres, Pharaoh's magicians who did counterfeit signs and wonders, Paul tells us. If possible, the elect will be deceived, Jesus said, and they'll be deceived by false signs and wonders. As Jesus said, a wicked generation seeks the sign. I believe in signs when they're practiced biblically. But when you find people seeking a sign, seeking a manifestation, Jesus said that is wickedness. You watch these videos tomorrow, you'll see people seeking signs. Jesus said they're seeking after wickedness. That's what Jesus said. Let's look further. These people talk about getting an anointing. First of all, these people do not know what an anointing is. Different liquids typify the Holy Spirit in different aspects of his being and ministry. Maim Hayim in Hebrew, living water is the Holy Spirit outpoured, as in Isaiah 44, 3, or as in John 7, 38 and 39. This he spoke of the Spirit. It comes in John 7 from what we call in Hebrew, Simcha Beth Shoivah. The temple ritual was pouring out water on the Temple Mount at the Jewish Feast of Booths, Hag Sukkot. It's a picture of the millennia in Ezekiel 47. All these people who are telling you the water's up to here, then up to here, then up to here, it's a lot of rubbish. They don't understand what Sim Kabet the Shoiva means in Judaism. It's about the millennia, a separate subject. Nonetheless, living water is the spirit outpoured, but it's the spirit. Isaiah 24, 7, new wine is the Holy Spirit in worship but it's the Holy Spirit, new wine. But shemen, oil, shemen in Hebrew, is the anointing of the Spirit. All of these liquids are the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a he, he is not an it. You cannot grieve in it, you cannot blaspheme in it. They are calling a he an it. If anybody is blaspheming the Spirit, it's these people doing this, except they're doing it in ignorance, most of them. The Holy Spirit is God, and he's worshipped in the context of the Trinity. Nowhere is the Holy Spirit ever prayed to in the Bible except when he's worshipped as a member of the triunity of the Godhead. All of this stuff, come Holy Spirit, good morning Holy Spirit, not one of it has one single speck of biblical basis. It's people who don't know what they're talking about writing their own Bibles, like Andrew Evans, the General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Australia, or Benny Hinn of these people. But it has no basis in the Word of God. None. None. The Holy Spirit always points people to Jesus. Let's look at this idea of anointing in Acts 2, which they all quote from but never seem to read. We'll look at two verses in Acts 2, Acts 2.33. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you see and hear. But then in verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, that is Christ, this Jesus, or Yeshua, whom you crucified. Notice, first of all, it talks about the anointing in conjunction with crucifixion. The Lord Jesus was anointed for burial before he was anointed for power, wasn't he? What was St. Paul's proof of his anointing as an apostle? His miracles were real, unlike the leg pulling you see today. His miracles were real, but that was never the proof of his anointing. 
the churches he planted, they were never the proof of his anointing. All the people saved, not bogus figures like you see today, he had real conversion. But that was not the proof of his anointing. Was it the books of the Bible he wrote? No, that was not the proof of his anointing. Paul's proof of his anointing as an apostle was the stigmata. He was anointed for burial. I bear the marks of Christ on my body. It was a crucified life that was the proof of his anointing. Jesus was anointed for burial before he was power. If you are not seeing a crucified life, you are not seeing an anointed vessel. I don't care how much power they seem to have. Lord, did we not do miracles in your name? Yeah, you did. Get lost. That's what Jesus said. But let's look. Look at verse 36 again. The Lord has made him Messiah. That means anointed one, Christ. Who was anointed? Christ. Jesus is the anointed one. Nobody has an anointing. You hear what I said? Nobody has an anointing. He has it. To understand what this text is saying, you have to understand Psalm 133, the Jewish concept of anointing. Look at Psalm 133, verses 1 and 2. Everybody look at it. If you're on the Bible, share a Bible with the person next to you. Please. Look at Psalm 133. It begins by talking about unity. How good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Then it says, it's like precious oil upon the beard, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robe. Aaron, the high priest, is a picture of who in Hebrews? Who's Aaron a picture of? Hebrews. The high priest is a picture of type of who? Jesus. Jesus is a high priest. The oil is poured on Aaron's head, and it goes off his head onto the members of his body, doesn't it? On the day of Pentecost, the Spirit is poured out on Jesus. He's the head of the body. And it goes off the head onto the rest of the body with the members. How lovely on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news, therefore shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. Feet are evangelists. You can be a very good evangelist, an excellent foot, but it's no good in the corner. It must be attached to the body and under the head to be anointed. You understand? The eye is the lamp. This is Midrash, the Jewish way of interpreting scripture. The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye is sound, the body will be sound also. Why? Because thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It gives light to the body. Teachers. The New Testament contains twice as much exhortation to right doctrine as it does right conduct. You know why? Because if you don't have right doctrine, you won't know what right conduct is. To have born-again Catholics praying in tongues to Mary, which is an abomination, praying to the dead, and people like Phil Zabritsky saying that's all right. The eye is sound, the body will be sound also. But for the eye to be of any value, it must be attached to the body and under the head. Only Jesus was anointed on Pentecost. Our anointing comes from being attached to his body and under his headship. If somebody is not under the headship of Christ, they have no anointing because the oil can only come from the head. Now, King Saul was indeed God's anointed. David wouldn't touch him in the cave of Angeli. I won't touch God's anointed. Whenever you find these guys teaching error, things directly contrary to Scripture, or catch them in a swindle, touch not my anointed. That becomes their defense. I'm immune. No, King David would never touch Saul. But did that ever stop David? Or is the prophet Samuel from telling the truth about Saul? No. Therefore, it should not stop you from telling the truth about people like Benny Hinn and Rodney Brown and Kenneth Copeland. That's assuming that God's anointed, which is a big doubt in itself. But even if they were, that's not what touched on my anointed means. No, David wouldn't touch him, but David sure told the truth about him. I wish these silly people would read the Bible before they try to quote from it. But then again, 
They're charismatics and Pentecostals whose leaders don't even know any better. How can I expect anything from the poor people? They don't know what anointing is. Let's look at Exodus 30:30. 30, 30. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister as priests to me. And you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. Pay attention. It shall not be poured on anyone's head, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportion that is holy and shall be holy to you. Whoever shall mix any like it or puts any of it on the head of a layman shall be cut off from his people. It's holy. Holy in Hebrew, mekudeshet lecha. Literally, set apart by God unto you. Whatever your anointing is from Jesus, whatever oil just off of him unto you, is holy unto you, set apart by God unto you. Mekudeshet lecha. It's an abomination to try to give your anointing to somebody else. Do you see that? We can lay hands on the sick and pray for their healing when the Lord leads. We can lay hands on people, commissioning them for ministry. As in Acts 13, we can pray for spirit baptism. But to try to give your anointing to somebody else, God says it's an abomination. Yet we have people taking your tithes and offerings to go to Toronto to get somebody else's so-called anointing, thousands and thousands of dollars in airfare, to bring it back and give it to you. And you're paying for it. And God says it's an abomination. When Elijah was asked by Elisha, give me your mantle. Elisha said, said, give me your mantle. Elijah said, I can't give that to you. You wait here. The mantle had to fall from the chariot. Only God can give it. He couldn't give it to him. Only God can give it. Tomorrow you'll see the video of David Sherman of the Assemblies of God, who was brought into this country by Wayne Hughes of the Assemblies of God, saying, if you want a double portion of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Come up here and touch the hem of my garment. The age of Elijah is over. It's a new age. You want the spirit? Come up and touch my coat. And the executive of the Assemblies of God, followed by a stampede of Assemblies of God ministers, and I am Assemblies of God, come up, kneel down, and touch his coat. This is an abomination. And the AOG leadership in this country tried to hide it from the people and bring it into this country without anybody challenging it, even though they knew about it. That's the kind of thing that goes on these days. The word of God is not respected because God himself is not respected. If the word of God is not being respected, it means that God himself is not being respected. It's an abomination. Yet these people are saying, get it, get it, get it. What is it? The anointing of the Spirit is the Holy Spirit himself. He is not an it. Secondly, it is mekudeshet lacha. It is yours. You can't give it to somebody else, and somebody else can't give theirs to you. It must drip off the head onto the body. But let's look further. Look at Exodus 33, verse 2. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. I will not go up in your midst because you are obstinate people, lest I destroy you on the way. Where the people get the perverted idea that because God is doing something, because God is on the move, that it means he's with us. God says, I'm going to do these things for my glory, for my name's sake. I'm going to do these things, but it's nothing to do with you. It doesn't mean I'm with you. If I was with you, I would destroy you, he said. Lord, do we not do miracles in your name? Maybe for God's own glory and for the good of others, he's using them. But Jesus never said you'd know them by their gifts. He said you'd know them by their fruits. Don't tell me a prosperity preacher will go up to an old lady who's dying, living on a pension. The only thing she has left is her faith in Jesus. As she prepares to leave this fallen world, the only thing she has left is her faith in Jesus. And one of these con artists from America says, no, you don't even have that. You don't even have faith in Jesus, otherwise you'd be healed because he's perverting scripture. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. What's more, he's doing it to suck money out of her. These people are the lowest of the low. Their message is from hell, not from God. 
I don't say people don't get healed. But for his own glory and the good of others, God will use who God will. I will not do in your midst, even though the signs will be there. Depart from me, I never knew you, he says. Where do they get this idea? They're looking at the gifted and the gift instead of the gift tour. They've got it all wrong. Let's continue. Remember, when they make this golden calf, something was happening. God was about to do something. Whenever you see a golden calf like Toronto, it's because the devil knows God is really doing something. The Reformation, God was really going to do something. So you have the Munster Anabaptists going bananas. It's always been like that. Yes, God is working and moving and preparing and wanting to do something. That's why you have this. Forget about the baby in the bathwater. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's two different paths. Derek Prince, on his latest tape, modifies his previous position in that booklet, which he has certain regrets about, if you heard his latest tape. And he warns that the Jews were not to make a garment out of flax and wool. God hates a mixture. If there's a mixture, it's no good. Get rid of it, says Derek Prince. Derek Prince is right. I don't always agree with him, but I usually agree with him. And in this case, he's right. But let's look further. Why does Aaron do it? Why in Exodus 32 does Aaron do it? That's simple. Aaron does it because of popular pressure. Why do most ministers who've gone into Toronto, why have they done it? Popular pressure. All the other ministers are doing it, and they're afraid they'll lose people to the other churches, so they do it. People in that church begin to say they're having it over there, and it's the move of God. We want it. Instead of going to the Lord and examining God's word, they give in to popular pressure. Remember this. If you remember nothing else tonight, remember this. When people fear man, it means they are not fearing God. When people fear man, it means they are not fearing God. Popular pressure. That's why they're doing it. That's why Aaron did it. That's why they always make a golden calf. And they make a feast which looks biblical but is unbiblical. Remember, a golden calf counterfeits the real God. The priests of Baal thought they were worshipping the true Baal. Yahweh was to be Israel's true Baal, Israel's husband. Idolatry is called adultery in the Bible. The Hebrew word is znut, whoredom, or harlotry. When Israel goes into idolatry, God calls it znut, whoredom. Oh, daughter of Zion, you've played the harlot, this kind of thing. Israel's Baal was to be Yahweh. But they get into another Baal who counterfeits him. That's what a golden calf always is. What do the people say to Aaron? This is the God who brought you out of Egypt. The priest of Baal thought that the Baal calf cult was the real God. Once you begin to worship the true God in an unbiblical way, an alien spirit gets in and counterfeits him. Do not exceed the things which are written. Do not burn strange fire. But let's continue. They make a feast, we're told. Celebration praise. The whole thing begins to get staged. Now look at the next verse 6. So at this feast, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. That is a bad translation. It doesn't say in the Hebrew original that they rose up to play. It says they rose up to laugh. Is there holy laughter in the Bible? Yes, Isaac, Isaac, he shall laugh. There's holy laughter. But Hebrew has different kinds of verb structures, seven different ones, and there's two here that are important. A PL and a Kal. A PL is a heavy structure, and a Kal is a light one. 
If the people laughed spontaneously, if it was holy laughter, God would have done something and it would have been spontaneous laughter. It would say the people rose up to lit hope, lit hope, like we get Isaac, Yitzhak, he shall laugh. If it was spontaneous laughter, if it was something that happened as a result of what God did, it would, have, it would say the people rose up to lit hope. It doesn't say that. It's not a call, call verb. It's a different infinitive. The people rose up to let the heck. Let the heck is a PL structure of the infinitive. It means a contrived, predetermined, foreplanned effort organized to fulfill the purpose of the verb. In other words, the laughter was staged, manipulated. When the people rise up to laugh and God does it, they just rise up and God would make them laugh. It would be lit hope. Here it's let the heck, it's manipulated, it's staged. Watch the videos for yourself tomorrow. That's what happened in the book of Exodus 32, and that's what's going on today. Manipulation, hypnotic induction. As I told you yesterday, if I was to put on a video of a stage hypnotist like Paul McKenna, or Ori Geller over here, and put on a video of Benny Hinn or Rodney Brown over here, you would not be able to tell the difference. They would be doing the same thing by hypnotic induction and psychological predisposition. It's the same. The only difference is people like Rodney Brown, by twisting Bible verses out of context, are combining hypnotic induction with spiritual seduction. That's the only difference. It is a counterfeit. The people rose up to laugh, staged laughter. But let's continue. We're then told that the people corrupted themselves. And in verse 9, the people are obstinate. Obstinate. Obstinance in the Bible is called also makshafut, witchcraft. This hypnotic induction is witchcraft, but when people persist in it, rebellion is also witchcraft. Makshafut, the same word in Hebrew. Anyone seeing the videos we watch today that would persist and say it's God is either someone who is very stupid or very rebellious or a combination of the two. Nobody who's looking at Jesus and believing the word of God can watch those videos and say this is his spirit. Nobody. But they're obstinate. When we show these videos, as we did today, you find four kinds of people. You find people who will always believe this Toronto thing was a counterfeit, and they have their suspicions reinforced. Then you have people who are on the fence. They weren't sure. It might be it's a mixture of good and bad. After seeing the videos, they're sure it's bad. Any truth in it? Of course there is. There's always real cheese in the rat trap. What's it say in First Peter chapter 2, verse 1? False teachers and false prophets will arise, secretly introducing heresies. That word is parasogzusin in Greek. It means they lay truth aside to error, the way Satan did. Of course there's some truth in Kenneth Copeland's teaching or Rodney Brown's teaching. The devil is much too clever to tell an obvious lie. His lies are perversions of truth. Prosperity theology is a perversion of a truth. Kingdom now theology is a perversion of a truth. Ecumenism is a perversion of a truth. They secretly introduce heresies. They parasoluce it. They lay truth aside to error and get you to swallow the whole thing. Two pieces of bread. First the mustard, then tomato, then lettuce, then cheese, then meat. Good sandwich. But then in the middle, you put some arsenic. Bon appetit. Palace of Zusen. Rodney Brown. Let's continue. The people are obstinate. They persist in a rebellion. The other kinds of people who see this video, people who are into Toronto and get converted out of it when they see the leaders and the people, what they're teaching. You see, you've always had extremism. In the early days of Pentecostalism, you had people who went off the deep end. You always had that. But it wasn't the main leaders. 
West, we put an end to it. Now it's the main leaders advocating that theopomorphic men imitate chimpanzees like John Onnett. Come tomorrow, see the video. I'll tell you a brief story. A little less than a year ago, I was in the jungle in Indonesia. I had these big coconuts. And you had to hit the cut, not like the ones you get in the supermarket. They were big things with six huffs. And you had to hit the things with a machete three or four times to get the top off, to get the juice out. And I was in one of these platforms with a fast roof built on stilts over the water, like you might see in Asia, Southeast Asia. And there's people pounding on drums up in the jungle. And somebody says, come here, you have to see this. So I go up into the bush, and there's these people pounding on drums. And they begin doing erotic dances. The dance steps obviously were somehow sexually connotated. And some of them put on masks of demons, like, and of grotesque faces and dragons and things. And they begin doing these dances, even more erotically, pounding on the drums. And I was told they're calling down the spirits. The spirits are going to manifest. But when the spirits manifest, I couldn't believe it. They take the masks off. This one guy gets down in front of me. I wanted to make sure it was not lazy the mouth, sleight of hand. It wasn't. He picks up a wedge of glass about the size of the palm of your hand, and right in front of me, he eats it. No blood. Then he picks up one of these husks. He gets down. You know, you have these orangutans in, in Indonesia. He gets down like he's a gorilla or a monkey or something, and he picks up one of these huge coconuts. And right in front of me, he rips the thing to bits with his teeth. And I mean, you know, you hack these things with a machete. He's doing it with his teeth. He does something that not only a monkey would do, something only a monkey could do. I was told, that's the monkey spirit. I said, what? That's the monkey spirit. Now, I was into the occult before I was saved. I've seen a lot of weird stuff, but this is one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. I'd never saw anything quite like a human being imitating an animal and engaging in animal-like behavior that only animals could do. I never saw anything like it before. Until I got off the plane in London at Heathrow and went to Holy Trinity Brompton. Not only did I see the monkey spirit, I saw the French poodle spirit. <laughs> I think this guy had the platypus spirit. <laughs> There was a woman down on the floor clucking her arms like this and clucking like a chicken. I was told this is laying an egg for Jesus because God has had something new. I said, what do you call this? They said, revival. I said, what? They said, revival. So what are you trying to revive? The wind of the zoo? What are you, nuts? I was saved in a revival. I saw guys coming back from Vietnam totally strung out on heroin, no cold turkey, no withdrawal, giving their lives to Jesus in droves. People totally into acid trips, acid in the cult, crazy. We were firebombing police cars during the Vietnam War. There was a revival among hippies called the Jesus Movement. Forget about thousands saved. Forget about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these kids began getting saved in droves. Nobody could understand it. The result, it revolutionized evangelical North America. The biggest church is like Calvary Chapel. It's all these ex hippies and stuff. That's what it is. All these things like Christ for the nation, use of the mission, it all came from this. I saw a real revival. Don't tell me this stupid garbage is revival. This is not revival. I was saved in a revival. I saw what revival is. This has nothing to do with revival. Then you have the people who remain in Toronto when they see these videos. They still believe it because they're obstinate, but they somehow lose their capacity to persuade other people who have seen the videos to take the quote-unquote blessing. Those are the four types. Why the people knew Toronto was wrong and then have the proof of the pudding. They're divided and not sure, then they're sure it's wrong. They're into Toronto, but they get converted out of it, or they stay in it, but they've lost their capacity to persuade others. Come, bring your friends, let them see the videos for themselves. Bring your friends and neighbors and families into Toronto, let them see the videos for themselves. Some videos we couldn't show you. We can show you pastors having convulsions, women beginning to rip their clothes off, we can show you that stuff. There's other stuff that's unfit to be seen, 
publicly Christian women down on the floor having sexual orgasms in church saying it's the Holy Spirit. If you contest this, of course, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The big scandal we have in London now, the London Healing Mission at Toronto meetings, the women were told to remove their knickers, come forward, and have Holy Communion wine poured on their genitals to drive the demons out. The minister's in jail. This is in all the newspapers. Some of this stuff, obviously, we wouldn't want anybody to see. But some, just come tomorrow, you, what you'll see is bad enough. You'll see John Arnott. You'll see him praying for somebody who begins screaming like a madman, falling on his back, yelling like he's being tortured. You'll see Randy Clark. You'll see stuff you wouldn't believe tomorrow. Bring your friends. Watch the videos for yourselves. Who was here this afternoon and saw some of the videos? Am I telling you the truth? Bring your friends. But the people are obstinate. Some people will choose rebellion. Joshua comes down the mountain with Moses and Caleb. And what happens? There's a sound of war in the camp, but it's not the sound of triumph. Not the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry.